I recently drove one of the most interesting and unusual vehicles that I have ever driven yesterday. That was the all new Honda CRV EFCEV, or the plug in hybrid fuel cell electric CRV. Obviously, there are pros and cons with that vehicle. I will let you wander over to the Auto Buyer's Guide channel to check out that video. In this video, we're going to talk about hydrogen, talk about some of the facts, some of the myths, some of the pros, some of the cons, and we're going to try and keep things completely above board and try really and not factor in some of the, the, the weird, I guess, feelings that people have around fuel cells, because for some reason, this seems to be a strangely emotional topic. And the first thing that we should cover here is I do not understand why this is treated as if it's a zero sum game. A car company spending a modest amount of research R&D dollars on fuel cell technology does not seem to really take away from the market, from you and me being able to buy an EV. Even if Honda, for instance, spent zero money on battery electric vehicles, that doesn't affect your ability or my ability to buy an EV today because we have a ton of really great electric vehicle options. And there is a future for hydrogen in some applications I am absolutely positive what that future is, that's what we're going to try and discuss in this particular video. Let's try and keep the emotion out of it in the comment section, although I do have my flame suit on just in case, because a lot of the, the commentary and feedback that I have seen definitely seems to be driven by one particular source. It seems to be people that say hydrogen's not green, hydrogen is bad, hydrogen is X, Y, and Z. Elon Musk said A, B, and Z, and whatever, and there are a lot of Elon Musk quotes going on here. Now, obviously, Elon was in the business of selling battery electric vehicles, so of course he's going to say, my battery electric vehicles are better than fuel cells, and they are certainly better in some applications. Now let's dive into fuel cells and fuel cell technology. The first thing you should know is that if you are looking at a battery electric vehicle, and a fuel cell vehicle, sort of like an apples to apples comparison, you're looking at it wrong because we have battery electric vehicles that are full actual products today that you could buy. You can buy hundreds of thousands of if you want. And there is no such thing on the fuel cell side. The fuel cell technology that we see today is still in its infancy. The best way to look at a fuel cell car, whether you're looking at a Mirai or a Nexo or one of these new CRV things, or perhaps an upcoming Grenadier or a BMW fuel cell, whatever, is that these are rolling prototypes. And normally companies would have rolling prototypes out there that only inside executives or researchers and engineers could drive. The general public was never allowed to drive, for instance, the very early prototype electric vehicles or prototypes of, I don't know, a Corvette or a new Tesla, whatever. But this is the weird kind of prototype that you can actually either go and buy in some limited instances, or at the very least lease from car companies. And this is exactly why the CRV fuel cell is A, only going to be produced in tiny numbers, about 300 for California, B, why it's only in California because it's a small geographic area, and C, why you can only lease one because Honda doesn't really want any of these CRVs hanging out there past their intended lifetime. The best corollary for today's 21st century fuel cell electric vehicles is maybe the first attempts at making a lithium ion powered vehicle back in the mid 1990s. There was theoretically a production one around 1998. It didn't really go well, and it took quite some time before we had what we would consider a modern battery electric vehicle powered by a lithium ion battery. Remember that we've had a lot more time, generally speaking, and a lot more money put onto current lithium ion technology than we see current fuel cell technology. Fuel cell technology, it's been around for a while, but they haven't really spent a lot of money and a lot of time on it until relatively recently, and it's come in, in fits and starts. The amount spent on fuel cell development is a small rounding error compared to the amount of global R&D money spent on lithium ion batteries, solid state batteries, the next technology and battery them, et cetera. So that's the, the most important thing to understand here. The second thing is this zero sum game. So far, there is no evidence that any amount of R&D spending from regular car companies out there has any direct impact on that same car company's spend on battery electric technology. Yes, there is a finite amount of money, but when you look at, say, Hyundai, they're going gangbusters on EV development, definitely ahead of car 
are companies that have spent zero money on fuel cell development. So if we were to compare, for instance, Hyundai's trajectory and their electrification compared to, I don't know, say Stellantis that hasn't really spent any money on a whole lot of stuff, you'll see that it doesn't really seem to impact their decision process on battery electric vehicles. Now, let's get into some other items here. For instance, fuel cell detractors usually focus in on a few things. Uh, the renewable cred of the vehicle, etc., or they will try and hammer on the renewable cred of whoever is talking about fuel cells in anything less than a negative fashion. And this is not meant to be a pro-fuel cell video by any stretch. This is meant to be more of a balanced approach. But full disclosure, I have owned several battery electric vehicles. I had a Kia Soul EV. That was my absolute favorite. Nice, tiny, efficient EV. I've also owned a fuel cell vehicle for one of the reasons I'm going to talk about in this video. I also happen to live off grid for environmental choices. So I would put my green credentials against a whole bunch of people's any day of the week. Uh, I also live on 13 acres also for green credential reasons because I wanted to make sure I preserved some redwood forest for my future generations here. So with all of that there, I will also say that the office that I'm currently in, we pay extra to, uh, to buy 100% renewable sourced energy here as well. Now, moving along, hydrogen itself, how does it work? What are we talking about here? Well, the first thing is we're not talking about burning hydrogen. So one thing I've heard out there in occasional circles is hydrogen vehicles have bad nitrous oxide emissions. Well, that is true if you're combusting hydrogen. So that is a concern for, say, some of Toyota and BMW's early plans or the ones that keep getting resurrected here and there where they're talking about just using a regular reciprocating engine and jamming some hydrogen in there. Nitrous, nitrous oxide concerns are valid there, although some recent studies have said that perhaps the calculations being used are not accurate and maybe the emissions are a little bit lower than they would be otherwise. Still not a zero emissions vehicle, though. I would not qualify that as a hydrogen future that I would look forward to, mind you. Uh, what I would look forward to is the fuel cell EV technology. Here's how this works. It's a proton exchange membrane. So basically inside the fuel cell stack, there's a hydrogen path and there's an air path. Between the two, we have an anode, a cathode, and we have a permeable membrane there. Basically, you jam hydrogen on one side it forces the proton through the membrane where it then combines with oxygen on the side, creating H2O. The electron, it goes off and powers whatever you want to power, returning on the other side because, of course, you need an electron on the other side to have hydrogen. Otherwise, you just have a free electron and a free proton there. Now, this is where we have to embark on the first downsides for hydrogen technology. Efficiency is clearly a problem here, not just because the fuel cell stack itself is somewhere between 50 and 65 percent efficient, depending on the version and the addition of the fuel cell we're talking about. Prototypes and labs have reached 70 percent efficient, and supposedly the theoretical maximum for a hydrogen fuel cell stack of this design is about 83 to 84 percent. That's actually not the major efficiency problem. It's getting the hydrogen in the first place. And the most logical way to do this in a green renewable fashion is, say, you use solar energy, you electrolyze water, you get hydrogen, you get oxygen, you let the oxygen go or do whatever you want with it, capture it and resell it, etc. And then you capture that hydrogen and you use it in a fuel cell vehicle. This is also going to be the easiest way to get hydrogen for vehicles because it's nice and clean. You get pure hydrogen off the other side, assuming you're dealing with pure water. And there are some concerns about steam reformation of natural gas or methane sources in fuel cell vehicles because you can actually end up fouling the membrane inside the fuel cell stack itself. So this is actually an easier way to get pure hydrogen in that way. Now, this is where we need to take a divergence and say that one of the myths about hydrogen fuel cell vehicles specifically is that hydrogen is very, very bad in these vehicles. Lots of samples out there, or studies out there, imply that less than 5% of all hydrogen comes from a renewable source. That is 100% true if we are talking about industrial hydrogen. So if you go on down to air gas or air liquid or wherever you get your industrial gases near you and you buy a tank of hydrogen, it's probably coming from steam reformation of natural gas or methane or some other sources. You can even get it when cracking long chains of hydrocarbons, etc. Lots of ways to get hydrogen out of things because there's a lot of hydrogen in everything that's around us. That's not, by and large, where fuel cell vehicles get their fuel. 
by law in California, it must be at least 33% renewable to be dispensed into a vehicle. Depending on the report you're looking at over the last few years, California has been running between 45 and 65% renewable station to station. And True Zero has a pledge to go 100% renewable in the future. And currently, there are a number of stations in California that dispense 100% renewable hydrogen. I was not able to get an official comment from True Zero before we published this video, but it does appear that almost every True Zero station in California at the moment is powered by 100% renewable hydrogen. You can actually go to the California Fuel Cell Partnership website and see what the sticker renewable blend is for a particular station. Almost all the True Zero stations are recently now saying 100%. Formerly, they were between 33 and 66. And the Iwanti stations, the Shell stations that are closing, those were all around 33%. At this point, I have to diverge from a little bit of the narrative at the moment and say that although I would love 100% renewable hydrogen in everything, I'm actually okay with a little bit of not renewable hydrogen, at least for the moment, as long as there was a requirement that this tapered off in some sort of logical fashion. The first reason there would be, obviously, we don't have very many hydrogen vehicles around. The second reason is, based on the efficiency and emissions numbers that we see, even if you fed your hydrogen vehicle 50% renewable hydrogen, we're still talking about an improvement getting someone out of a gasoline vehicle. Obviously not as good as getting someone into a battery electric vehicle with 100% renewable energy, but that's where some of the rest of this conversation comes in. So stay with me here for just a moment. The next thing is about the cycle efficiency. If your shtick is efficiency, then you should shtick with battery electric here. Um, and here is the entire efficiency picture. So ICE engines, theoretically 30% efficient as far as getting the energy extracted from the vehicle there. Modern fuel cells, again, about 6 to 65%. Theoretical limit of 80%. Problem is you have to electrolyze it which means you're consuming energy. There's no way you're gonna break that chemical bond and then snap it back together and get the same energy out of it that it took to get you there in the first place. So you're losing at least 20% there. You then lose a decent amount in compressing, transporting, liquefying hydrogen, et cetera. A lot of numbers out there are based and focused solely on transporting uh, gaseous hydrogen. That's actually not how most hydrogen for fuel cell vehicles is transported. Another myth there that needs to go bye-bye. It's actually transported in liquid form although it doesn't actually change the math here much. It's still not efficient on the hydrogen side if we're talking about electricity in to electricity for your final product motivating you down the road. But here is where hydrogen has an advantage, big vehicles. If, for instance, we take a look at the average 100 kilowatt fuel cell stack right now, say the one in a Hyundai Nexo, it weighs only about 200 pounds, and that's the entire fuel cell stack itself, all the plumbing in the unit itself. If we're talking about all the cooling and everything else on the vehicle that needs to support it, we're talking about another 100 to 150 pounds. And all in, we're talking a complete system weight of maybe about 400 pounds total for the hydrogen system. That is actually quite light when we're talking about a vehicle that can go 350 to 400 miles relatively easily. I said that I owned a Nexo. My Nexo was rated for 350 miles of EPA range. I routinely beat that without worrying about the, uh, the tank uh, as far as how much hydrogen it had in it once I was used to how far it could go. As long as I could get a 90 to 95% fill, I could solidly depend on 350 miles of actual highway range. And that's simply because of the amount of energy you can store on board. Hydrogen is significantly more energy dense than a lithium ion battery if we're talking about energy per unit of weight. Obviously, volumetrically, hydrogen has a problem. And that's a problem also because it has to be stored in cylinders. Because of the way gases work and pressure works, we're talking about 10,000 PSI of hydrogen, you got to store it in a cylinder. And that round shape is a little bit more difficult to package than a battery that can be nice and square and sit sort of skateboard style underneath the vehicle. But back to the weight here. A Honda CRV hybrid plug-in, for instance, that is 350 pounds heavier than the regular CRV hybrid that runs on gas. So fuel cell plus a battery that's 17 times larger than the one that we find on that regular hybrid model, it's only about a 350 pound weight penalty. And Honda was pretty upfront that if you actually deleted that battery and took it down to regular hybrid sized battery pack like we find in a Mirai or a Nexo, it would actually be lighter than the regular Honda CRV hybrid. That's one of the big advantages to hydrogen is curb weight. 
And here's why that's important. Imagine instead of a 9,000 pound or a 10,000 pound Hummer or a big truck, you could get a 6,000 pound truck. Still big, still heavy, but remember the customer's interested in that but you could have a one that's a lot lighter. You could also uh, use fewer tires. You'd burn through tires not as rapidly. You'd use less energy generally because the vehicle could be more efficient. You could still have stupid, crazy numbers. And remember, we're not talking about efficiency here, but it would allow that format of vehicle to not only exist in a lighter format that could be safer for everybody, it would also allow it to be refilled rapidly. And honestly, a battery that is that enormous it's never going to charge rapidly in the terms that a customer that you're trying to convert into an EV would accept. I would not think it's a problem to spend 30 minutes charging a Hummer if it only took 30 minutes to go 0% to 100% because a lot of people really are focused on that 100% charge time. Again, not rational. That's where the customer is. And that's the other thing we have to really focus on here. This is a video not about you and me. This is a video about you and me trying to understand who this product is for. And if you believe in a zero emissions future, like I do, a world where we need to focus on climate, we need to focus on emissions, so we have a world that still functions for our children, then we have to convince everybody else to come on board. And I'm sorry, if you're talking about uh, a bro out there rolling coal, there's no way that a nice, efficient city EV that is totally rational, total practical is going to float his or her boat. It's just not going to happen. We need to meet them where they are and have electric or alternative fueled solutions that are renewable and lower emissions or zero emissions to fill their wants and their desires. This is not about need. If this was truly about need, we would not see the number of pickup trucks and SUVs and everything else that we find in America. That's not what this is about. This is again about trying to meet that customer where they are. And this is where I will say <clears throat> that our current crop of, of plug-in hybrid vehicles, well, the plug-in hybrid fuel cell one that we have, and the fuel cell regular hybrids that we have out there, they don't make the world's greatest sense or the best case for this, especially the Toyota Mirai. The Mirai looks great. It's a sexy car. It's a fabulous landing at absolutely the wrong airport because for that format of vehicle, a battery probably makes more sense. If you're talking about city vehicles, daily commuters, any of that sort of thing, even moderate distance road trippers, someone that's going to do 300 miles in one day, it's probably better that you stick a battery in it. A Model 3, pretty darn light. Optimized for battery electric operation. It's sleek, it's aerodynamic. You can charge it in a window that's, I think, acceptable to that customer, etc. That's not a problem. What is more of a problem is, say, again, that Hummer, the Silverado EV, the upcoming Ram EV, a Lightning, a Rivian, etc. That customer that wants to be able to theoretically supposedly tow, I don't know why, but 10,000 pounds for thousands of miles without ever stopping to go to the bathroom. You know what? If you focus on that, on, on the battery electric side, you're never going to capture that customer. But if you could say, hey, we're going to sacrifice this on the altar of efficiency, for the sake of capturing this customer, you could create a hydrogen vehicle that could do that. It could refill in five minutes. It could give them 400 miles of range, 300 miles of range while they're towing. It could fit, fit that need. And trucks and those larger vehicles, that's where it makes sense because there's room for the tanks to be underneath the vehicle. It would not make sense at all to have an electric smart car converted to hydrogen. That would be really weird. It would probably be dumb, let me just say. Minis, the average compact crossover, etc. that doesn't make a lot of sense. Now, circling back to the why we have what we have, there it does make sense because, again, these are rolling prototypes. Toyota does not really believe that everybody needs an electric luxury sedan that's rear-wheel drive, etc. They're trying to get research and development miles on these vehicles to get information out there. And that's why we see some slightly different formats from different manufacturers. We see the CRV with the plug-in hybrid, see how that goes for Honda. We have the Mirai, let's see how that goes. We have the Toyota partnership with BMW. We'll see how those vehicles end up. There's an X5 fuel cell vehicle right now. We also have the upcoming Grenadier fuel cell vehicle that has been proposed. We'll see if that actually makes it into production. We have some full-size heavy-duty trucks from General Motors that are going to be using the same fuel cell setup that we find in the Honda because that's a joint venture. That's where it makes more sense to me. Now, let's move this along to uh, talk about station storage and icing and filling because that's another common uh, thing that I have heard out there. Now, 
This is not at all to say that fueling hydrogen vehicles is without problem. But I will say that for the people out there that are talking about sample sets of one, let's talk about my sample set of one. Three years in a Nexo, about 34,000 miles on the clock. We had troubles filling it up for about two and a half weeks of that entire ownership cycle. And it was a bummer. It could not move. In fact, one day we actually had to tow it because one of the other employees on the other side decided to drive it, not really thinking about where the hydrogen was going, didn't look at the app, and was worried about running out of fuel. They actually did not run out of hydrogen, so don't get me wrong there, but out of an abundance of caution, we had them stop it, picked them up, towed the Nexo back until we could refill it. We've also recently seen some exits from the hydrogen market. Iwanti is on shaky ground and Shell has called it quits. We don't know exactly what's going to happen to those Shell stations, but it's anybody's guess. And that brings me along to another one of these internet memes, that somehow this is all being promoted by big oil. When you actually look at it, big oil does not have a whole lot of money going on in the hydrogen game. However, I don't necessarily think that that is a problem, and here's why. Big Oil, they have a lot of experience in producing and moving fuels around, logistics, etc., and a lot of money to spend on investment. If we can convert people, that is a benefit to everybody. If you can convert Chevron from being the company that's that's been furthering fossil fuels and emitting tons of, of greenhouse gas, etc., if you can convert them into a greedy company that is also selling zero emissions products, why would that not be a good thing? I think we have succeeded if you can get that kind of company to be involved. The problem, of course, is that these stations don't make money, and that's not really what they're after. Also, First Element is the biggest seller of retail hydrogen for vehicles in California. They're not associated with any oil company out there in that way. In fact, their shareholders generally tend to be uh, Honda, Toyota, Hyundai, etc. So actually, Honda and Toyota have a pretty big interest in First Element. They're really just working together to make this prototype thing work at the moment. And that brings us along to the stations and the station drama. There's no better way to say this. If you are not okay with drama filling your vehicle, don't get a hydrogen car. There's plenty of options out there for you. The main reason I bought a Nexo is because A, it was zero emissions, and B, I've never had a hydrogen car before. I had a diesel before, I've had gasoline cars before, I've had hybrids, electric cars, I've had plug-in hybrids, but I'd never owned a hydrogen car. So I wanted to know what it was like, and now I know. And as a result, I know that, yes, on occasion, you can have troubles getting the nozzle on the vehicle. But by and large, the new handle designs have really put a stop to that. The original handles, the weird lever lock ones, those were not great. The newer ones that look sort of like fuel nozzles, those are a little bit better. And then the really new ones that are these weird cylinders that have a collar that you're uh, supposed to slide on and off uh, in a very strange motion, mind you. I do aware, I'm do aware that that, uh, that looks bad at any rate. Um, those actually work pretty darn well on the hydrogen vehicles. There are also some other solutions that can happen here. You can have handle warmers. You can have liquid heating on the, the end of the adapter to make this work. These are not insurmountable problems. But again, they do exist. Availability of the fuel, that's the bigger problem. And here's where things are a little bit sketchy. You know, again, this is an R&D project. So in a world where this was a reality and a real future, we would see greater attention to the fueling. This is kind of a shoestring budget situation here, and it's full of a lot of older stations. There are two ways to store your hydrogen in hydrogen fueling setups. You can store it in gaseous form, or you can store it in liquid form. And there's a big, big difference in capacity between the two. The average gaseous station, which you will definitely see in the Bay Area or Los Angeles, they'll store under 100 kilograms of hydrogen. Not a lot. Bearing in mind that a Nexo can hold 6 kilograms of hydrogen, you know, some of the stations could only fill 10 of these vehicles without getting refilled. But the newer generation of stations, they store hydrogen in liquid form because you can store an awful lot more. Now, there are pros and cons to each of these. Storing hydrogen in liquid form means that you have to allow hydrogen to off-gas because you're storing it in a cryogenic vessel. The only way to keep it liquid is to keep it cold. There is no pressure that we can humanly achieve on Earth, well, I should say rationally achieve, on planet Earth at atmospheric temperatures and regular atmospheric pressures on the outside that would keep hydrogen in liquid form. It's not like liquid propane. Liquid propane, you put it in a cylinder, if the pressure's high enough, it'll stay liquid. That theoretically could happen at hydrogen. Uh, with hydrogen, it's just not rationally achievable on planet Earth, unfortunately, with our modern technologies. And that's why it's stored in gaseous form on vehicles, and that's why you have to allow it to off-gas on the station side. But that's much more efficient as far as the amount of hydrogen you can store. You just have to be uh, aware that there's going to be some loss of hydrogen out there to the atmosphere. 
The next thing you need to know is that there are still a lot of unknowns when it comes to hydrogen. We don't know how long the tanks are going to last. We don't know how long the fuel cell stacks are going to last. And that's, again, why most of these are leased. That brings us along to the next one, which is the cost of hydrogen. Retail cost of hydrogen is actually quite low unless we're talking about hydrogen for fuel cell vehicles. Part of that is, of course, because of the 100% renewable blend that we see in a lot of stations. You can be paying nearly $40 a kilogram for hydrogen at some stations. It had a severe ramp up last year. It used to be around $11 to $12 a kilogram. Now it's near $40 a kilogram. So massive, massive increase. The problem here is, uh, you know, or the pro, I guess, side on hydrogen is that because this is a prototype deal, the average person is not actually paying for hydrogen. This is one of those weird things that I hear bandied around all the time is don't get a hydrogen vehicle. It's going to eat you alive in fuel costs. Well, the reality is almost all hydrogen vehicles are leased. 100% of Hondas are leased. The vast majority, over 90% of Hyundais and Toyotas are leased. And if you're looking at one, I wouldn't buy one. I would lease one. And in either of these cases, for three years, you have essentially free fuel. It really is going to depend on the exact cost of hydrogen in your area. But at the moment, every hydrogen vehicle comes with a $15,000 fuel card. Now, I think the origin of some of these stories is that reviewers like me or wherever you're getting your car content, when they send out cars to these people to review the fuel cell vehicle, for some reason, they don't give them a hydrogen card. And that leads to every story out there on a fuel cell vehicle, every review focusing really hard on the cost of hydrogen. When reality is for you, the customer may be interested in hydrogen. You're not paying anything to fill the vehicle. Now, because of the recent hydrogen price hike, there is a possibility that if you maximize your lease, go 36,000 miles with your new fuel cell Nexo or whatever, that you could end up paying maybe about $2,000 of hydrogen by the end of the lease if you're stopping at one of the most expensive hydrogen stations in the state. But these numbers are obviously going to vary. We don't know what Honda has in store for the fuel cell CRV coming up soon, but I suspect that they're actually going to bump that fuel card up a little bit to try and compensate for the increase in hydrogen costs. Any way you slice it, you're going to be paying an awful lot more for 36,000 miles of driving in the average hybrid or even a lot of plug-in hybrids. $2,000 over three years and 36,000 miles is actually not a great deal as far as the fuel costs, but it is something you have to think about. And that brings me along to my final thoughts. Hydrogen has a lot of promise. It also has a lot of downsides. But again, we're talking about a future and a future technology that is not trying to compete for the same hearts and souls as battery electric. If you are a lover of battery electric vehicles, buy a battery electric vehicle. I don't think that that is a problem at all. This is not a zero sum game. Producing more hydrogen vehicles does not mean fewer battery electric vehicles for you or me or anybody else. That's not how this works. Yes, there are batteries required for a fuel cell vehicle, but there are fewer batteries required in one than for a battery electric vehicle. And there are certainly synergies here because they can use the same electric motors. They can use the same control systems. They can use a lot of the same vehicle systems and setups, etc. They will require to be optimized for each format, different floor pans, different safety structures, and different stampings there. But there's still a lot of synergies that could be achieved. In a rational world where maybe I was designing this rational world, if I can clarify that for people that might be uh, confused, I would say fuel cell technology makes a lot of sense in full-size SUVs, full-size pickup trucks, medium-duty trucks, etc. Maybe, maybe large crossovers, big three-row vehicles, etc. Where things really start falling apart for hydrogen is when you get smaller than maybe something like a Toyota Highlander that's a two-row, maybe something like a, I don't know, a Chevy Traverse that's a three-row. Anything smaller than that really doesn't make the most logical sense. Don't get me wrong, I loved my Hyundai Nexo. It would give you an honest-to-goodness 350 miles of range between charges, and it would charge in five minutes absolutely no problem. Again, assuming there was hydrogen. But you know what? If I were to repeat that process again, I would not have a problem getting something like an Ionic 5 and doing 250 miles of range and a really rapid charge because that Hyundai charges pretty rapidly. And with some minor tweaks, I could see a future where that Ionic 5 could pretty easily give me 350 miles of range, still only take about 18 minutes to charge, and still be relatively lightweight. Now, this is something of an apples to oranges comparison because the dimensions of the vehicles are a little bit different. And of course, the Ionic 5 has a lot more power. 
But the Nexo had more range, and it actually was lighter than the last Ionic 5 that I drove. That is certainly the promise of hydrogen fuel cell technology. Now, I will say, backing up just a little bit, that when we're talking about hydrogen production, one of the reasons given for states like Hawaii or countries like South Korea or Japan, one of the reasons that some of these places that are more isolated, one of the reasons they're interested in hydrogen is because you could have this ability for rapid filling, for energy storage, and you could generate this off of green energy, green electricity, rather than trying to shuttle in oil, et cetera. And here's how some of this logic goes. When I look at my solar production in the summer, I'm spending four to five hours sometimes a day where I could be generating 10 kilowatts easily for this many hours, but I have nowhere to put it because I'm at work and my car's not at home, so can't charge at home. If, for instance, you look at this on a larger scale and you could say, well, we could put this energy at these peak solar hours to use and we could then electrolyze hydrogen, and then we could use it somewhere else, whether that's a stationary storage system, et cetera, that could be useful. You might be thinking, well, hey, buy more batteries. That's certainly something you could do as well. But then again, we have that resource question there. Where is the resource better allocated? Is better allocated to this, better allocated to that? You know, I don't know. Sometimes you have to be willing to sacrifice efficiency for some other ideals and some other concerns. For instance, in my off-grid setup at home, I decided that I was willing to accept some of the lower efficiencies for having a lead-acid battery pack because at that exact moment, that lead-acid battery pack was not only less expensive, but it also had an easily definable future for recycling. Yes, we can recycle lithium-ion batteries, but the pipeline for recycling is still a little bit unclear, certainly more focused than when I went off-grid, but at that time, those batteries were almost 100% post-consumer content already, and I know absolutely without a doubt that when those batteries are, are at the end of their life, I can take them to a recycling center. Every bit of lead will be stripped out of them and properly recycled. So a lot of those concerns happen here. Let me know what you think about that down there in the comment section below and what you think about hydrogen fuel cells. Again, keeping in mind, this is not a zero sum game. And again, also, we have to look at this as a world where we have to attract people into these vehicles. If you could get one bro to stop rolling coal and start rolling a Hummer fuel cell, then you have succeeded, even though that is not as green as getting that exact same person into a Model 3 or a Soul EV or a, a microscopic EV car that hasn't been invented yet. Clearly, yes, that would be even better, but you have still achieved something if you can get someone to stop burning fossil fuels and start looking towards a more renewable future. Anyway, let me know what you think about all that down there in the comment section and stay tuned for more videos like this. See all of you later.